Good evening, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Kelly Ann Naylor, and I'm pleased to be the moderator for today's session, Integrating Water Resources for Urban Sustainability, which is part of the 8th Knowledge Summit 2023. We have the honor of being the final session, the last but not least to wrap up this year's summit. So while um, our participants are joining, we just wanted to go over a couple quick housekeeping items. Um, you will note that there is a simultaneous interpretation services available in Arabic. So um, please feel free to, 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 to put in that function. Um, and we also really want to encourage your active engagement in today's session by um, submitting your questions through the designated questions and answer uh, section in the uh, Zoom function. So um, that brings us now to our session. Since the dawn of civilization, human settlements and water resources have been inseparable. Water is essential for, for people to drink, to clean, for sanitation systems, to cultivate, to fish, to manufacture, to produce energy, to navigate for tourism, as well as many cultural and religious ceremonies. But while water has been a friend, it's also been a foe. And as cities grow, so do their water challenges. In recent years, we've heard about examples like Cape Town, which faced a day zero scenario when the city would run out of water. Or tragic situations in Libya and Pakistan where floodwaters tore through urban settlements, leaving a path of disruption. In the Middle East region, it's estimated that 60% of the region's water flows across international borders, which adds to the management challenge. Water can be a factor of conflict or a catalyst for peace. We're so pleased you could join today's session because we're gonna dig into these critical questions and how we can better manage the integration of water sources in urban environments. Our main overarching session topics today will be water resources management, integration into urban resilience planning, smart water technologies, and water equity and cross-boundary water management. We have three extremely knowledgeable and dynamic experts with us today. We're really in for a um, really interesting discussion. And we're gonna start um, first with a spotlight presentation from each of our panelists. We'll then move to an interactive panel discussion followed by the questions and answers. Um, and just as a reminder, please do share those questions as we go in the Q&A function. So let's get started right away. We're going to move to our first panelist, Dr. Dinara Ziginshina, who is the director of the Scientific Information Center of the Interstate Commission for Water Coordination in Central Asia, which is a regional organization that contributes to fostering transboundary water cooperation in the region through data, information, and knowledge development and dissemination. She has more than 20 ex years of experience working as a legal and policy expert in water resources, and she's currently the vice chair of the Implementation Commission under the Convention on the Protection and Use of Transboundary Water Courses and International Lakes, which many of us know as the Water Convention. She's a governor at the World Water Council and an associate professor at the Ta Tashkent Institute of Irrigation and Agricultural Mechanization. Um, so, Dr. Janira, um, over to you for our first uh, Spotlight presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. And um, hello, everyone. I'm very pleased that today we are discussing this, indeed, the very important topic. And it's probably we reserve the best place in the Knowledge Summit for the water, to discuss the water. And I would like to briefly introduce you to the subject of transboundary waters. So let's start with the definition, what we mean by transboundary waters. It's the waters, it's the aquifers, lake and river basin system that are shared between two or more countries. And it's more than 60% of the world fresh water are transboundary waters. 153 countries have territory within at least one of those transboundary basins. And we have about 300 transboundary river and lake basins, it's the surface water, and we, we have 
almost 600 transboundary aquifer system. And I think much more will come when we have more deeper assessment of groundwater systems. And we all understand how important transboundary waters are for all our life as a humans, as a ecosystems, and as economies. And still, we also have to understand the threats and risk that we have um, with regard of transboundary waters because of the very high competition due to population growth, economic development, and also climate change implication. And we've seen in many parts of the globe, overuse of water, water pollution, degradation of the ecosystems, biodiversity loss, which is very closely related to the quality and quantity of water. And on top of this, we have climate change implication that impact both the formation of water, how much water we have, where we have this water, and also how we use this water, because climate change means uh, most of the time increasing temperatures, at least in the region that we live, in the arid regions. And the more water would be needed for growing crops and for the technological systems, so it really uh, creates a lot of risk and tensions, but also opportunities for us as a knowledge community to deal with these risks. And here I'm, I would like to present you a map that was designed and, and developed by UNEP in 2016 when they um, developed very comprehensive assessment of transboundary water systems, both groundwater system and river basin systems. In this slide, you can see uh, some assessments of transboundary river basin systems, which indicate a lot of trends that we have with relation to water. And as you can see, we have four main risk hotspots for transboundary river basins, and they are located in Middle East, in Central Asia, and uh, also in um, uh, Southeast Asia on Ganga's Brahmaputra Manga Basin, and also in Southern Africa, Orange and Limpopo Basins. And this risk relates to water quantity, water quality, ecosystem quality, and also has to do with the governance system uh, that need to be improved in order to deal with this risk in the future. So all this illustrates how we need to accelerate the actions because if we don't, then we might have more widespread conflicts, not only between the countries, but between different territories and communities to get access to water. And by access to water, I mean not only physical access, but also economic access to water. And this is what um, equity issues come uh, into play. When we uh, talk about access to water, it's really who has access to water? What kind of community? Do we really include vulnerable people and communities into the, the whole governance system to ensure that really no one uh, left behind? In the media, we very often uh, see uh, this news about the water conflicts and tensions between the countries, between different provinces and between different users. Uh, and indeed, the conflicts or tensions are increasing in frequency in intensity. But if, if you look at the facts, you see for sure that cooperation over water prevails over disagreements, tensions, and conflicts. Just a few examples why I'm saying so. Uh, we have uh, 800 water-related agreements, and it's only formal agreements that counted in this case. In addition to that, we have informal arrangements, commissions, groups, working groups, and expert groups, different arrangements within which countries cooperate with each other. We have more than 100, uh, 120 river basin commissions, which helps to implement, coordinate, and uh, collect information, provide assessments for the countries on their transboundary waters. And I'm very proud as being international lawyer that River Basin Commission been the first international organization ever that was created in the world. So this um, brings 
probably us to understanding how important water for our communities if first international organization was created about water to manage water. And finally, the recent assessment that was done by SDG 6.5.2 on transboundary water cooperation shows us that 58% of transboundary basins globally are covered by operational arrangements for water cooperation. So here you see a huge potential for us to develop to make it 100% to be sure that we have these cooperative arrangements, information exchange, regular exchanges between the countries, and also uh, assessments that helps to sustain, maintain, and develop relations over transboundary waters. And what is needed more and more, and what is important for our discussion today on the Knowledge Summit, is evidence-based decision-making at all levels to address those risks that I was discussing and increase cooperation. And here I'm talking not only on transboundary level, it's very important to work at all levels, st starting from international and uh, up to uh, individual level and community level. And my final slide, when I'm, I do my attempt to summarize what is evidence-based decision-making and how data and knowledge can contribute to more informed water management and more increased and deeper transboundary cooperation. It will help us to gather more reliable data, to do more reliable research and modeling exercise, to really expect and plan for the future, because with the climate change, our future is becoming more uncertain and we need the stronger data to be prepared. We also need this increase the science policy interface. Very often we see scientists talking to each other and policymakers not really uh, engaged in this dialogue. We have to increase these connections and we have to push the technical expertise in developing and implementing cooperative arrangements through different conventions, both global and Bayesian and e even bilateral. We also need to strengthen capacity and awareness in evidence-based decision-making. And today's discussion, I hope, will contribute to this. We need the leadership and transformation in our mindsets because the way we think, analyze, and make use of data really help us to better manage and to adjust our behavior towards more cooperative and more water-wise behavior. We also need investment in joint uh, uh, acquisition of data and exchange of data. Uh, sometimes we don't have trust to the data that was collected in other countries. And that's why we have to enable these joint uh, programs for knowledge and information and also push innovative solutions in different transboundary basins, not to be afraid of innovative and experimental probably solutions. And this is where the youth Engagement is very important, I think. And um, technological transformation and digitalization, it's very important to drive this, uh, this, this process further. And this is last slide that I'm not going to do, uh, go deep into about, but we very often discuss about blockchain, but not in water or environmental field. And it's only starting to be discussed. And I think it's a huge potential how we can build trust and transparency using the blockchain system, in, uh, introducing the blockchain system into the in, um, water management. And I saw example of United Arabic Emirates where uh, the blockchain based solution were proposed to store and manage water and electricity consumption transaction in these countries. And we also have examples of, of these to be implemented in Colorado River Basin and Australia. So I really hope that we can make use of these technologies for the better water management. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ziganshina. Um, I, I think you really, um, I think not only laid out the challenges, but also um, these solutions and how the um, data and knowledge can contribute to addressing the risks and, and evidence-based decision-making. And I love the point about cooperation prevailing over conflicts and how 
um, innovation and and um, this it, it, blockchain example, I hope we'll have a chance to hear a little bit more about it later in the session, um, can be part of bringing about new ways of, of doing things that could make management, as you said, more equitable, more transparent um, by using a technology. So thank, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Um, and now we're going to move to our next uh, speaker, um, who um, is Professor Rabi H. Motar. Um, he is a professor in the Department of Biolo uh, Biological and Agricultural Engineering um, and the Zachary Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Texas A&M University. His research focuses on the global resource challenges and the development of a water energy food nexus framework for linking science and policy and characterizing the soil water medium and on applications for sustainable integrated water management. He's also a governor of the World Water Council and vice president of the governance committee of the International Water Resources Association. Um, Dr. Motar, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, um, over to you um, for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and thank you for the opportunity to share with you some of the uh, experiences in this area. Uh, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I was happy to be with you. Uh, we'll talk about kind of complementary to what Dinara was talking about. Uh, and I really struck me to talk about the synergy and the cooperation and the, the, the science-based decision-making, which I will be focusing on. Uh, the topic is the system view to water resources management, which I think is now emerging as a need uh, when it comes to uh, sustainable development. Uh, of course, this is a water-centric view of the sustainable development goals, but I truly believe that water touches on all of the uh, goals uh, in terms of uh, not only explicitly uh, in goal number six, focusing on, on water, but also when it comes to livelihood, health, uh, food security, hunger, uh, participation, and, and cooperation, which is uh, what we're talking about here. So so the, the water is at the center, I believe, of the sustainable development, and it needs to be looked at in that way. However, having said that, uh, the and, and I hope we can discuss this further later, the water system does uh, uh, exist within a bigger system of interactions when it comes to food, energy, health, uh, and, and other uh, overarching goals such as uh, sustainable diets. We talked about integrated water resources management, energy efficiency within a la larger framework also of governance that we talked about with Dinara earlier, society and business uh, supply chain issues, political issues, technology. So there is a bigger framework that water system exists and it needs to be looked at in that framework because a lot of the water challenges that we're talking about are not only bounded to the water sector, but they do cross boundaries. And I think that's the message that I'd like you uh, to take from the take home message from, from this presentation is that we cannot look at water in a silo. We have to look at it as a system that interacts with other systems. And that uh, system of systems, as we call it, is needed to be looked at and that as, as a package. In that vein, I'd like to introduce the, a new vision for IWRM, Integrated Water Resources Management. And this is the report that we uh, uh, actually launched uh, with the World Water Council a few months ago in at the uh, Water Congress, at the IWRA Water Congress in Beijing, China, where water is part of a bigger system. And we're looking at water for people, water for food, water for nature, water for industry, water for peace, for education, for health, for equity, and for energy. So water does look in, into all of the sustainable development issues. And the challenge that we were facing is that up until now, there's no framework that really captures uh, uh, these integ integration and these interactions. And uh, in this report, we did talk about explicitly a roadmap of how we identify stakeholders, how we identify solutions that may be outside that water sector. How do we define what we call the trade-offs and how do we uh, identify these synergies and solutions that uh, uh, outline 
uh, the, the water challenge and the sustainable development challenges. So in this presentation, I want to share with you very briefly an example, a simple example of how this may, may exist. And I'm going to take a case study in Metagorda County in Texas. Uh, and that's Metagorda County is used to be traditionally a, a agricultural community. They produce a lot of rice. They have uh, abundant resources of water. But with the growing population in the metropolitan area of Houston, uh, which is very close to, uh, to Metagorda County, uh, other issues uh, or other challenges of water use for the community in, tax in Houston, the growing population, and for the energy sector that uh, allows uh, uh, Houston to grow, especially, specifically in the, uh, uh, you know, Houston is the capital energy of the world, but also there is a huge uh, 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 nuclear energy power plant that uses a lot of that water. So this is the land use and you could see a lot of development, high intensity development and the green area still some, some areas around Houston that's still agriculture. So you could see uh, the competition for water between the metropolitan area of Houston, the agriculture and also with the energy demand uh, for, for, for that water. So there's a potential, uh, uh, I wouldn't call it potential conflict, but a potential synergy that exists that I'm gonna highlight. So uh, in this specific application, uh, the I'd like us to explore the research questions. How does water energy food nexus approach, which is a system of systems that I introduced earlier, can help water related infrastructure decisions to help alleviate water stresses in Metagota County, which is a county at the, at the uh, kind of the suburb of, of Houston. So we looked at system level solutions and, and uh, we looked at the Nexus tool that integrates water and energy food platform as a, 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 a mean to quantify the trade-off. This is the, the decision kind of science decision-making uh, uh, policy interaction. Uh, identify feasible interventions, and we want to draw some conclusions that allow us to say, okay, using this system of systems approach, how can we develop these synergies and win-win situations? And I'm going to very briefly walk you through a complex analytics that allow us to, to look into this. And in this here, analytics uh, focused on uh, a, a complete portfolio of the food, of the water and the energy, complete interactions between the water, energy, food. And we looked at various uh, scenarios and these scenarios focus on infrastructure. So how can infrastructure that is built to synergize between water, and energy, food can help us uh, look at a better future for, for the county when it comes to economic development, when it comes to resource uh, allocation. So. The, the, the approach we use is that we develop this analytical tool that allow us to analyze and assess these scenarios to help guide future investment that not only will help the water sector, but will help the agriculture, the municipalities and water access to the municipalities and also the energy sector. So in, in a very brief uh, uh, kind of outcome analysis, we did numerous uh, holistic approach to look at all various technologies and, and uh, compare those to the base scenario, which is business as usual as it exists today. And the best scenario that, just to give you some, some ideas of what, what we analyze, uh, we looked into conveyance system improvement that reduces the water loss on farm irrigation improvement that also improves the irrigation efficiency. Building new reservoir was another option that allow us to store some of the runoff water uh, for storage later, building desalination for brackish water that allow also for, uh, by the way, uh, in that area, the groundwater is brackish because it's close to the uh, coastal areas. Uh, so that is one of the uh, infrastructure solutions that we invest investigated, building water treatment for reuse that also increases the efficiency and seawater use for cooling. Uh, now, that is a, a, a an issue with the energy sector today because of the uh, uh, implication but we also look at that and in addition to, to, to uh, a solar farm. So uh, very kind of high level concluding remark that the Nexus approach provide a platform to choose the most suitable combination of water, energy, food infrastructure that we analyzed. If the best scenario is applied, 
we uh, our analysis actually shows a win-win analysis where there's no interruption in any of the businesses for the energy water use, where the indoor and outdoor municipal water is met, industrial users for mining and processing, and as well as the energy sector is also uninterrupted. And uh, when it comes to the farming, which is the base economy for that county, uh, we also see a lot of benefits uh, despite infrastructure cost. And last but not least, because agriculture is a foundation for the economy in, in, in this county, uh, uh, we believe that this not only trickles down to agriculture, but it helps the, the entire uh, economy of the county. Overall, primary resources are saved with less environmental damage using these approaches. Thank you very much. Uh, been a pleasure. And I look forward to engaging with some more questions. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Motar, for that um, really insightful presentation. I think a lot of times we talk about the multiple uses of water, we talk about nexus approaches, um, but to actually be able to see an example um, and how you've applied this approach um, is really, um, for me, it's the first time I've really seen it broken down um, like that to, to be able to show how um, Many times, you know, decisions affecting water are happening in sectors outside of um, what we think is a traditional water sector. So the way you've broken it down, it really shows how the different pieces come together for, as you said, that decision making process. Um, thank you so much um, for that. And uh, we'll definitely, I'm sure... A lot of people hopefully are, are putting questions and answers into the question and answer function so we can continue the, the discussion. Um, and I think um, Dr. Motar, or Professor Motar, building on your, your point about the multiple uses of water, certainly the private sector is um, a major water user um, and um, one where we've also seen a lot of innovations and uh, new technologies being applied um, to be able to find solutions. So we're um, very lucky for our third uh, panel member to have uh, Helen Hulett with us. She is an industrial water security specialist with Talbot. She's an experienced advisor specializing in industrial water risk, water-related environmental, social, um, and corporate governance, and sustainability. She um, has, uh, with her focus on industrial water security, she's worked with leading companies such as Coca-Cola, um, Lovo Sugar Africa, Sapi, Aspen, and Sassel, um, and looking at how to really blend environmental stewardship with business excellence to be an advocate for responsible water management and utilization. Um, so Helen, we're um, really looking forward to hearing um, a private sector perspective uh, from you. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much, Kelly, and good evening, everyone. Um, and thank you for inviting me. It's nice that industry um, is actually represented at these type of talks that often aren't. Um, Kelly, can you see my screen, my presentation? Not yet. Yeah, it is. I couldn't figure out. And screen two. Okay. And now. So yeah, I see as slides Kelly... coming up. Oh, there it goes. We yeah. can see it now. We can see it thank now. Thank you. Coming. Thank you, Prof. Um, as Kelly gave the introduction, my name is Helen Hewlett. I'm located in South Africa. South Africa, as been mentioned already in this call, has a massive water supply issue, water crisis. It's quite complex, it's multifaceted, um, and there's no real one solution. And what industry is realizing, and it came up in Dinara's talk, which was really interesting, is that collaboration, we've got to get our heads around collaboration, um, especially in the industrial space and looking at the broader problem. So to give you some insights, just a bit of introduction into industrial water. The industrial sector uses only about 20% of the global water supplies, which isn't huge compared to agriculture and irrigation. And that number varies depending on region or which statistics you're looking at. However, industry is massively important in water scarce regions because at one, it becomes a competitor to the local communities when water scarcity hits. The figure on the right is Nelson Mandela Bay drought in 2023. Everyone has heard of the Cape Town Day Zero. Not many people have heard of the Nelson Mandela Day and Bay Day Zero, which nearly hit this year. 
And then in, during that time, communities and industry started to compete against each other for water because communities had to line up for their water and industry was still getting their water or their water was throttled and turned off. And the next area that industry can significantly impact scarce water resources is through contamination of scarce water resources. The picture on the left is a figure taken from our recent um, regulatory system showing all of the non-compliant discharges into South African rivers. Now, the majority of those are caused by municipal domestic systems, so it's domestic waste, but that's not to say that a lot of it is also industrial waste going into, into the rivers. A lot of industry aren't compliant or their compliance is um, variable. And whereas industry, um, where they do contribute is emerging contaminants, toxic contaminants, and they are having a massive impact on water resources. However, Industry is extremely important to sustainable economic growth. I mean, in South Africa, with load shedding, we realize you, you can't turn industry off, otherwise the country doesn't have an economy anymore. And a big issue in South Africa is as the water crisis starts to escalate, what will happen to our economy if we can't juggle this, if we can't figure out a solution for this issue? And companies across Africa and water scarce regions are realizing, one, they have to become more resilient. How do they do that? And two, they have to become part of the broader solution. Unlike the energy crisis where you can fix it in a silo and you can fix it by generating your own energy, there's no way to actually produce water in most regions. And you have to look at it as a collaborative problem. But why are industries struggling? One, they've got some very complex systems. They've got very complex water supply systems. Companies don't understand their water supply in systems. Industry don't understand it. I think most of the people on this call are quite um, well versed in terms of how catchments work, how water service providers work, how water authorities work. But if you're dealing with industry who are focusing predominantly during the day on how to just maintain their production, they actually don't know where their water comes from. So they're having to become experts in terms of their water supply chain. This figure on the right, is really just a simple diagram of a typical water supply chain for an industrial user going from basement all the way down to the reservoir that supplies them up the road and then where their wastewater goes. Okay, whereas internationally companies have been doing high level basin risk assessments for companies situated in water scarce regions, they're realizing that a basin risk assessment isn't enough, that the risk actually sits a lot of the time with the water service provider, the water authority, or just the, the river down the road and not the basin. The next complex complexity comes in with the water cycle. Industry is not a utility. They have very, very complex water cycles within their process. Okay? And those water cycles are dominated by both volume issues and quality issues. So industry is quickly having to become quite um, clued up and become experts on their production and how it's linked to their water usage and how it impacts quality within their system. And then, as I said, the most complex in issue for industry at the moment is figuring out how to work collaboratively with all the different um, role players and stakeholders. Um, within the within the problem. So working with government, working with catchment management agencies, working with communities and working with water service providers, they really don't know how to develop those collaborative models and how to effectively um, play them out. The trends that we see starting to see a lot of in industry is one, water efficiency, which is great. And um, so just reducing the amount of water that they use within their industrial processes. And two, you're starting to see a lot more water recycling and recovery or reuse. So industrial water um, provide industrial water users actually putting a wa water reuse plant um, at the back of their own facility and starting to reuse their water within their process, which is great because it does decrease the um, the pull on the community water resources. However, where industry needs to improve, and I think this is the next focus point for industry going forward, um, is actually doing this in a data-driven and um, informed manner. So whereas um, reuse initiatives and production um, initiatives aren't being informed by data all of the time, there's a massive opportunity and in where industry is starting to get wiser and where you're going to see a lot of um, technical advancement going forward is actually just using quality and volume data to optimize um, industrial water processes to ensure that they're re re uh, reducing their water requirements 
but also more importantly that they aren't contaminating the water within their their process as greatly as they used to okay so for as mentioned as for utilities where who are driven by volume and so you get the digital twin in a utility system for the industrial sector you're going to start seeing systems that are more focused on quality because it's quality that actually drives water efficiency within an industrial process and then finally i think the second area which industry has to get their head around um, and they're going to need help in this space is really just being part of the broader solution and better understand issues. Um, and this was picked up a lot in Dinara's um, presentation, actually, is just actually science-based um, understanding um, and targets, and then developing effective collaboration models, so working together um, to actually sort out the problem and become a, a part of the biggest solution. And thank you. Thank you again for inviting me to talk. Um, I look forward, to, if you have any. Um, a little bit later. And and thank you so much for that uh, excellent presentation. And I think you really highlighted. Oops, sorry, I'm hearing an echo. Um, how the uh, how the industrial water challenges and water management challenges are similar but different um, than those um, that we typically think of when we think of the uh, municipal sectors. Um, I found it really interesting kind of all these different elements that you highlighted about volume and quality issues and how that kind of affects the, the processes. Um, so thank you so much for that. Um, so that now um, brings us to the next part of our session today. And I think already you've heard the synergies between these three uh, panelists areas of work. Um, but now we're going to have a um, the interactive discussion. And for this for this question, we just like to put one out there. Um, really kind of looking ahead. Um, all of our speakers have talked about the uh, the UN's, uh, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, um, which are part of uh, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, and this is, of course, an ambitious kind of global agenda to, to put the world um, on track for human, uh, social, environmental, and economic prosperity. Um, we're at the midpoint of, of the 2030 agenda. We've um, at that halfway milestone. And we really wanted to say looking ahead for the next um, six years or seven years up until the end of 2030, um, what do you think should be the priority areas um, that should be focused on for knowledge and innovation to be able to effectively integrate water resources for urban sustainability? And I'd like to even put one more part of this question. If you want to look further ahead, um, 2030 is around the corner um, and looking ahead even beyond that, what do you think are some of the frontier issues that we should be tackling as we look at this post-2030 horizon. So I'll um, start first um, with uh, Professor Motar, um, and then we'll go to, to, to Helen and, and Dr. Denaira for the, um, their interventions. Over to you, Professor. Thank you, Kelly. A very appropriate question and very much in line with, with the discussions we have and listening to all the panelists coming from different angles. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, I have been very much in tune with the progress we have been making and lack of progress we've been making in, in the uh, SDGs agenda. Unfortunately, at all metrics, we're not meeting the targets. And, and let's just get maybe this uh, start as a starting point. So we're not there. Uh, we're not there in the climate agenda. We're not there in the SDG agenda. And... Uh, the two questions you raised, I think they're, they're interlinked, and I'd like to reflect on some of the research we're doing. Uh, and I believe that the way the SDGs were set, they're set by, I'm not sure if this is the right term, but by lobbies. And lobbyists are not necessarily bad. Uh, we all lobby for what we believe in. I'm a lobbyist for water. Doesn't mean, I mean, sometimes we do make connotation of lobbyists being a negative. That's not necessary. I'm a passionate about water, but I'm also passionate about soil and environment. So these are the, the, the SDGs were met uh, or were, were, were pushed by 
uh, agendas on what I call disciplinary agendas, uh, that individual groups pushing for one uh, goal at a time. And I believe this set the stage for conflict and this set the stage for lack of integration. And, and we have, we've been feeling it. I have the evidence and I share some of that evidence in, in my presentation that uh, the, the, uh, one of the missing links with the SDGs is how are we gonna work together in synergy rather than in, in competition. So when, the, when we're meeting the food security goals, we are infringing on water goals. When we're doing the water goals, we're infringing on the energy and the other goals. And I believe this is the starting point where we start diverging in our goals. So I do believe that, and, and I have the evidence to show uh, that we must look at endpoints and we must look at integrative outcome, integrative metrics that allow us all to converge and not diverge. And, and this is, I think, that, that it's, it's becoming evidence. We don't have the governance to enforce SDGs. So it's left for the national plans to meet those targets. But even the national plans are sometimes infringing on other national plans. So I think what the lessons learned for me is how do we come up with integrative endpoint metrics that allows for creativity and innovation in terms of synergy and not in conflict among these goals, where we're meeting one goal, but we're also uh, uh, meeting other goals as well. That's the challenge in how do we design those, but that's the only way to do it because at the moment, we're looking at this in silos and we're looking at this in, in a way that one target will infringe on uh, uh, not meeting the other target. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Motai, for those insights. And I think, as you said, we've all been feeling it. Um, and it's, it's um, I think, yes, very much need a new way forward. Um, so uh, next, we'll move to Helen. Um, no, I'm afraid I'm going to just really repeat what Prof. Um, Rabi said there. I completely agree. It's more more understanding how we collaborate, how we integrate um, these issues. We can't do it in silos, industry especially, and industry and all other sectors. I uh, also believe that we need to better understand the issues, better understand the risks, and better understand how we actually deal with those risks, which is going to take um, information sharing and, and communication. Yeah, but otherwise, um, I think Pro Professor said it really well. Kelly? <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thanks so much, Helen. And and as you said, I mean, the industry is 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 kind of is part of that. And they've been in some ways on the edges um, of the sustainable development goals, which of course is a government driven process, yet they um have big impacts on being able to achieve those goals. So it'll, I think, be really interesting to see how also going forward industry can can um yeah play a bigger role in in um achieving those metrics. Uh, Dr. Dinera, over over to you. Thank you. I, I do agree what has been said, but also I would like to highlight the um, diversities. Uh, you, you asked about the, how, how much we are on track to meet the SDGs, and we really have to be clear and open saying that the, the globally, we are really not on track to meet the SDG 6.1 on drinking water supply. And if you look at the global numbers, the coverage um, might look like a very good progress. And actually, it is very good progress because all countries significantly in, in, in improve access to drinking water supply. But unfortunately, you can see the huge diversity among the regions. So when we discuss what we have to do differently, probably our strategies also have to be different in different places, depending on the capacity of the countries. Uh, because if you look at them uh, on the numbers on low income countries, they will really to um, to increase the current rate of progress to more than six times for basic water supply and 20 times for safely managed water services. So it's definitely different strategy that we might have in Europe or North America from uh, what we might have in uh, uh, 
sub-Sahara Africa and other regions. So the first acceleration is required, but we also different, we might use the different strategy. Sometimes it's not only awareness and um, the good behavior, but also we need a lot of investment to implement those targets. And we didn't discuss finance and investment, but it's also hugely important. And the second point that I wanted to mention about groundwaters, very frequently we discussed mostly surface water, but groundwater is this invisible resource that we have to uh, manage more properly. The numbers that we have now really show that um, uh, the depletion of groundwater resources, but even more worrying for me, for example, when I was looking at the um, reports, national reports uh, on SDG, um, on 6.5.2, we see that even developed countries don't have enough data on groundwater. So in this case, it's not only uh, uh, diversity in the countries, it's general lack of understanding of the whole, um, how the groundwater system works. So this is three, uh, two points that I would like to mention uh, that we really have to focus our intent attention. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Dinera and all the panelists for your insights on kind of where we are, um, kind of midpoint of, of, of the 2030 agenda, but also where we need to go. And, and I think, as you said, it's not only an acceleration of going towards those goals, but maybe also a change in how we approach um, achieving those, those goals um, going forward. Um, so now um, we're going to take us into um, the the next part of our of our session today, and we've got some great questions that have uh, come in from our our participants. There there are let's see, I just uh, I think there's five questions. I think there's a couple that can um, go together, um, but maybe we'll start with the, with the first one that is on, um, educational initiatives and public awareness campaigns. And so the question is, um, how can educational initiatives and public awareness campaigns contribute to fostering a culture of water conservation and responsible water use in urban communities? Um, it's not directed to a, a panelist. Does anybody want to jump in first? Professor Ravi, do you want to go? I see you're yeah, unmuting. Absolutely. Being an educator, okay. uh, I, I would like to comment on this because I think it's, uh, and I mean, I do, I start many of my, my classes with a survey. And I can tell you that the young generation is much more aware of the older generation when it comes to doing the right thing and, and passionate about the, the wrong thing, uh, doing the, the, the right thing. And somehow when they go out of the, of the and, and, and as they move on in their career, they somehow we manage as a society to take away their passion to do something positive to the, to the, to the society. And I think uh, uh, that reminds me that education is not only should be restricted to when they are in college or when they are at school. There need to be a, a continuous reminder that we as a, as a society, we have choices to make. It's not only for governments and it's not only for private sector to make decisions on our behalf, but we should empower uh, each other. We should empower the young generation. We should, we should continue reminding ourselves that through our daily action, uh, we can make a difference. And, and I think this is something that a message that I'd like to, to, to convey that we all count and we all do matter. And our actions in terms of conservation of water, conservation of resources does matter. And it is important to keep that message uh, and, and not to compartmentalize our, our decisions. I'm a, I'm a citizen, but I could be, a, I could be also a decision maker. So we need to make sure that we do the right thing, uh, at home, at work, and, and when we are with, with friends and when we are uh, at, at the professional setting. And I think it's that's the, the key message about awareness, to do the right thing in throughout our, our uh, faces 
of, of actions that we do on a daily basis. Thank you very much for that um, inspiring <laughs> insight. And the uh, Anyone else want to come in? Dr. Denari, you talked a bit about um, transparency and the availability of information as part of trust building and, and transboundary cooperation. Do you want to maybe add anything on to this one? No, I think it's it's really when we have this information, and I do agree with Rabbi that sometimes the kids teach us how to properly uh, use water. I, I see it in my family for sure. And um, so I think the more we illustrate, and here I, I think we are in colleagues with the discussion, what is what uh, drives us to change, either fear or empathy or some exciting excitement or some hope that something can be different. Now we have all this water crisis, climate crisis threats, and sometimes we think that it can push us towards the good action. But now, just recently, I read the articles. You know, you were telling us 20 years ago that we are in collapse, in the climate collapse, but 20 years over, we're still alive, we still have water available, and all these forecasts were not were not true. And here's, I think we have to find really um, balance how we communicate information. And I think we are not, um, uh, we are not working enough in this uh, uh, cross-disciplinary way, how we communicate the, not only scientific information, but also how we work on neuroscience, with psychology, communicative practices, in the messages that we want to deliver, because we are really talking about very serious issues with the urbanization trend and with the water crisis, we we need to change the attitudes and behavior. And it really has to be the combination of both. One of the question was, is it economic incentives to save water or it's a more cultural behavioral change coming from the changing awareness and attitudes. It's everything. It's, we're really talking about the combination of everything. It's about technology. It's about economic incentive and stimul, uh, um, stimulus and probably sanctions or penalties. And um, so, so it's everything. And it's about educating ourselves, not about only the future, uh, generation, but also us educating and re-educating to reconnect back to nature and to water, to understand what 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 actually future we will be living in and how we have to be prepared. Thank you very much. And I think you've really kind of put your finger on the fact that the changes that we want to make, I mean, they require not only technical knowledge, but also political will and societal will um, to kind of participate in, in, in making those, those changes happen. Um, so I'm just watching the time and we've still got a few more questions. So Helen, if you forgive me, can we move to the next one? No, um, definitely. I think it's all being said. So please carry on. Okay, <laughs> great. So I think now we're gonna jump into data analytics and smart technologies. Um, so I'm gonna put two questions together um, and Helen, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll come to you first for a private sector perspective. So um, the first question is really around how the use of data analytics and real-time monitoring through smart technologies can enhance decision-making processes um, for water resources management. Um, and the second one is, is if you have any perspectives on how this can also avoid exacerbating existing um, social disparities and promote how technology can, impro uh, can promote inclusivity. So I think in the end, the private sector space, this is probably the area of the most opportunity going forward. Um, it has largely been ignored in terms of looking at the full process and actually monitoring you know, how water is used, how it's contaminated within processes, and therefore how much is discharged and of what quality. So as soon as companies in the private sector start to smarten up in this area and you start seeing new technologies available, um, and they're able to get the insights in terms of how they can optimize their systems, you're going to have a lot better in terms of social equity and social just 
better water resources for communities um, through industry not contaminating and not using as much water. So this is a this is a very exciting space for the industrial um, sector going forward. Thanks, Kelly. Sorry, I inevitably you end up on mute at one point. I'm trying to make it through without having that happen. Um, yeah, and uh, Professor Rabi, uh, smart technology. How did how can this help us with the nexus? I, uh, just building on what Helen was saying, data, uh, and actually building on what uh, what Dinara also mentioned about uh, uh, science based decision making. I think the the data is crucial in in driving science, and I think this is something that uh, uh, very critical. I mean, in, in in the example I showed, it's all about data. It's all about data coming in that allow us to understand the system and allow us to assess different interventions and the sustainability for long term. Uh, technology plays a huge role. And, and here I'd like also to build on what, what Helen was mentioning. Uh, and I, I would like to put in a, 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 uh, a challenge moving forward. Not only we need to look at the, the smart technologies, but we have to ask ourselves for what, for what reason? I think many of us engineers are, are fascinated by the fact that we can. And I'd like to put a challenge for us. As we ask the question, yes, we can build this technology, we need to put in the value added in terms of why and what, what value added this technology would have to, 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 to the human uh, uh, on, on, on the board. So having a human-centric smart technology and, and I think we, we've seen it with AI, we've seen it with many, many technologies that are out there that young, smart engineers put technologies because they can. And I'd like us to challenge, as an engineer myself, I'd like also to put another challenge is for what reason? What does it, how does it serve society? And how does it serve humankind? And I think we're missing that human dimensions to our thinking and we're missing the, the, the reason why we put technology forward. And I'd like us to keep in mind that at the end, all of all of our discussion about SDGs and sustainability and, and equity, it's about serving human. And a technology that, that is smart, but that does not serve human, I don't think it is smart. I think we need to redefine smart technology that allow us to have a human-centric uh, uh, to, to that, uh, not only in terms of what it can do, but why we're, we're putting that technology forward and, and how is it uh, supporting human health and, 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 and ecosystem uh, well-being. Uh, that's just a, my, my view. And I'm expanding my engineering into human engineering uh, be, beside the technological aspect. Thanks very much um, for that uh, human-centric technology perspective. Um, I think that's, yeah, that's great because we tend to lose sight sometimes about the end goal of, of what this technology is, is for. Um, so we're just, our minutes are flying by and time is never um, on our side. Um, Dr. Nair, I know you probably have a lot to say about this topic, but I think it's important that we do address financing. You brought it up um, and mentioning about, um, you know, we can have all these great ideas, but how can we get innovative financing models um, so that we can actually implement um, some of these solutions? Um, and I think the question is specifically how cities can explore to fund um, water-centric projects, infrastructure development to make sure that there is long-term uh, sustainability and resilience. Um, any perspectives, Dr. Denaire, from your standpoint? Yeah, I would say that we need public-private partnerships. It's what we're talking a lot, but it really has to be implemented using different models, different mechanisms, different communities. And probably it's not only public-private in the sense that it's state governments and private sector, but also it might be like a triangle with the community involvement. And I think it's, it's very important to make it, to localize it. So the people who live nearby our neighborhood, it's also involved in the processes, then they will be interested 
and they also can invest. So I think the future to engage people who live nearby and probably for us living in, I live in the old community that we know each other, you know, it's a very close community. Probably in the cities, it's difficult to um, reach that level of closeness. But, um, and especially in this very disconnected world now, but um, I think it might be different models for different places and for different cities that can be explored. One size cannot fit all, but we have to be very specific and content-based to, to try to find the specifically tailored solution for different cases uh, to, to make it work. We cannot provide the clear answers for everyone. It's, I think it really has to be carefully thought and um, really we have to more engage the private sector and the whole system because we, we cannot... We cannot support the whole, whole infrastructure in industry just from the government side. Thank you very much. And uh, Helen, our minutes are evaporating here, um, but um, just we've we uh, negotiated to borrow five minutes. So I hope our participants can stay with us um, just as we're wrapping up this final session of the Knowledge Summit. So Helen, you know, industry, mm -hmm faces tremendous financial risk um, if they run out of water um, with a lawsuit. So, so how can we kind of go from water being a risk to, to being an area where we can get more private sector investment up front in reducing water risks? Any insights that you have on that? No, unfortunately, lots. It is an area that we've been grappling with quite a lot. Um, I think Dinara is right. It's uh, PPPs. We've got to get that model right. And I like to input in terms of not just making it the big investment firm and government, but also including the role players within the area. I think that's probably closest to what needs to be done, because as soon as people are invested in their water resources, they are going to start looking after them uh, more appropriately and they are going to conserve them. So, yeah, I think Dinara probably hit the nail on the head there. I would agree with her. Thank you so much. So I want to end this great conversation with just a final message from each of our speakers. We have many young people, young professionals, um, Professor Ravi, as you talked about, who are at the start of their careers, who are looking ahead at this daunting water challenge, but also want to be able to do so, to be part of a positive change. So just maybe if each of you as kind of sector professionals, passionate water um, stewards, um, if you could just give a message, especially to our young professionals who are here today about kind of pursuing a career and, and addressing this water challenge and um, We'll just, uh, yeah, maybe Professor Rabbi, we'll start with you and go to Dr. Denier and Helen. That's the way you guys are lined up on my screen. <laughs> so over to you. Thank you, Kelly. And thank you for all of the great participation. I think this is wonderful. It's one of the highest uh, sessions I've attended. Uh, you know, I, I, will, I will end with where I started, that water is at the center of sustainable development and uh, water interventions. And I, I really feel that this has been a wonderful uh, panel. Uh, when we look at water interventions, their technological, their policy, their behavior. And my, my message that at the core of all of this is a personal choice. And my message, I'd like to end with an empowerment for all of us to make the right decisions, whether I'm an individual, whether I'm a, a CEO of a company or whether I'm a, a, a policy maker is an empowerment message that to do the right thing. Now, we, we tend to, let, to kind of uh, uh, feel that, oh, I cannot, I cannot do that. It's not me, it's, uh, it's somebody else. There was a message at the, and I, I, I intended to address this specific message. I have other things that I wanted to close, but I will close with this message in responding to one of the and questions that, that raise that it's only when the government allow for a change in the curriculum, then I can I can address these to my students. That let, let me let me look at it in a different way. 
we have responsibility to disseminate good practices and good knowledge and, and empower the young generation to do the right things. I personally, I'm not waiting for a curriculum change at my university to do that. I have a responsibility to go to walk into the class and, and allow for my students to be empowered to make the right decision. And empowering them is not only to do conservation at their home, empowering them is to do the right thing when they are working with industry, when they are working at, at, at the city level governance or where they're working at the federal or the state. That's the message is that we all do count and we all need to do the right thing at any different uh, responsibility we, we, we carry. So I'm, I, I'm not waiting for a policy change to do the right thing. I'm not waiting for the opportunity to come I'm, I'm creating that opportunity to, to disseminate, empowering people around us to do the right thing. And, and please take that home and take that to, to the heart because you do count. We all do count and we have to do collective action uh, because time is running away. And thank you so much. Thank you. Um, Dr. Dinera. Uh, thank you. It's it, it's a very difficult because, as Robbie said, we uh, we here kind of lobbying for water, and I I felt in this way. But then I thought, let's be biased. We all have biases, and let's be biased towards water. And it does not matter what profession and what field uh, people will choose, but to be patient about what you do and do not harm water because we all. We consist of water, like 70% of our body water. So consider yourself as being water. Don't harm yourself and do best what you can do in your life. Thank you. Thanks very much. And Helen, over to you to yeah. wrap it up the here. Final, the final word from me, I will say, and I'll honestly say that working in the water sector, if you're looking for careers, can be the most frustrating sector to work in. Um, just because there are so many different challenges. But that said, it can also be the most fulfilling sector to work in because everyone can make a difference. You can have any background, you can have any, you can have studied anything. Water requires all different nationalities, it requires all different um, specializations, it requires everyone to actually get involved. Um, and it is, it is a very challenging um, career, but hugely fulfilling and very valuable. If you want to make a difference, water is what is definitely the space where you can do it. And yeah, yeah thank and you for everyone for your time. Great, thanks to everyone. Thank you to our panelists for a fantastic discussion today. Thank you very much to the organizers for bringing us all together. Um, and with that, it uh, wraps up the uh, eighth Knowledge Summit and um, we'll look forward to uh, next year. <laughs> thanks very much.